Okay, so thank you everyone for joining. I really missed you. And I wanna tell you that I had classes in my mind giving it to you as things were happening when I was in Norway. I was saying, oh, I wanna say this and I wanna tell them that and how this one and that one. Meanwhile, you're just gonna hear about one akoda that I did with myself um, in Norway. And there's a huge akoda that I, need, that I need to do with myself. When I got back to Israel, I realized that. If we have time at the end of the class, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about the huge akoda. Meanwhile, I'm gonna give the small avoda that I did and what happened in, you know, as a result of it, or I don't know as a result of it, but what happened with it. So um, about like two months ago, I asked my son Shalama if he wanted to come with, to travel to Norway because my ratzon now is I would like to travel. And, we, and I don't have to do it, um, I could do it very, very low budget. It's so possible to do it. It's really easy to do it. Like I love campsites and I love camping in lodges and Shlomo is of that head also. If he had all the money in the world, he'd still want to go camping. So he said, yeah, he would like to come with me. I said, it's two weeks good for you. He said two weeks is great. And I, and um, we picked Norway. We wanted a place where we could hike and there's a lot of green and water and everything that we don't have in Israel or that we have in very teeny in Israel. And um, we, we went together and started and we were there from Tuesday. We were there for one week. At the end of the week, Shalama uh, wakes up in the morning and he turns to me, it's a Tuesday, we're there exactly a week. And he goes to me, Ima, I think that I have had my fill. I'm ready to go back home. I looked at him and I thought to myself, like, I totally knew that I need, I thought to myself, I don't want to go home at all. I want to continue staying here. And you actually committed to me that you're going to be here for two weeks. Um, however, I don't want my son, first of all, commitments we make to ourselves. We don't make to other people. I don't want anyone to do anything because they committed to me. And also we, should not do anything because we committed to anyone. If there's anyone that we commit to, it's to ourselves. So I told him, um, you can call the travel agent and book your ticket back and, um, and, and just take the train to Oslo. We both rented a car and we drove all over. We covered like hundreds of miles. Every night we slept in a different campsite. And um, for Shabbat, we slept, you know, three nights in a row in one place, like Thursday night, Friday night, and Shabbat, we always slept in one place. So we had a chance to explore certain places. And I told him, just you know, call the travel agent. Now, I left the room and I went to sit on the balcony and I called up Ralph and I vented to Ralph. I said, you know, I could have had other people come with me. I had friends that were interested in coming with me. I chose him and now he doesn't want. And now even if he does stay, I'm gonna feel like, it doesn't feel good to go with someone who doesn't even wanna be there. Ralph said, just, you told him what you told him, just now do what you want. Go about and do what you want and just, I said, fine. And I had always, I also have a very deep compulsion to be able to, to tell my children, you know, do, um, do whatever you want, uh, you know, go and I, I wanted to go tell Shlomo, you could totally go back, don't worry, I'm not gonna feel bad about it, you have to do what's good for you, uh, you need to live your life. All these things are things that make me pull down my fence, right? We said that we need to have a gaded, we need to have a fence around us. When I do that, it's like as if I'm taking care of my son and I'm not allowing him to take care of himself because I'm constantly trying to reassure him that he could do this and he could do that and I'm okay. And no, I need to stay within my gaded and be able to see and do what's good for me and let him see and decide to do what's good for him. Now, the reason I do it is I know because he's constantly thinking, I want to hurt her feelings. I don't want her to feel bad, but that's his issue. And it's not for me to take care of. 
I went back into the room and didn't say anything. And um, I started packing up and I asked him, you know, what are you thinking of doing? He said, I'm thinking of continuing with you. I said, great. And I, and, and, and I also did not say, you know, I hope you're not feeling bad about it. And I feel so bad for you. And, uh, you know, and, you know, what a bummer and everything like that. Um, and we started our day. We packed up the car. We started the day. And he gets a phone call. I, first of all, disconnected my phone. When I left, I just, um, I didn't get myself internet for Norway, but Shlomo did on his phone. And I just was able to, um, every couple of days, connect um, to the Wi-Fi in the campsite. And it was amazing, amazing, amazing not to be with the phone. It was so good. Anyone who really needed me knew they could call Shlomo. And I wasn't going to take Shlomo's phone and, you know, and connect to anyone. And that was also very liberating. And it turns out that Shlomo, since the minute we got to Norway, always updated his status on, on WhatsApp. And he was showing his friends where we were. And he had a couple of friends from Yeshiva that in Israel, a university starts after Sukkot. And they looked at it and they said, oh my God, it's so stunning. The pictures are beautiful. What? We want to be there also. They went online, found tickets to Norway that were $300, like half price of what I paid, and um, booked the ticket and flew to Norway. And on Wednesday, they were there and they asked Shalom, could we come and spend Shabbat with you? Shalom was like, perfect, great. They came Friday. Um, they, they came Friday. We spent together Friday, Shabbat, Sunday, Monday. We had four days together. Shlomo ended up having his friends, loving it, having a very good time. Um, I felt like my ability to somewhat stay within my gadet, to stay within my fence, not to go to his fence and start um, and, and give and stay within my gadet, give space to him, and really also give space to God to come and take care of it. It was such a long shot that his friends would ever get there. Also, once they got there, they didn't have a rented car. They needed to come in from public transportation and we were out in the boondocks. So, so I gave God the space to just do whatever he wanted to do. Whatever was going to happen was going to happen. But I wasn't going to come out of my skin or go out of myself to make it happen, go out of my comfort zone, try to take care of my son, try to take care of the friends. Um, at a certain point on Friday, they were supposed to get to us and Shalomo was finding the best routes for them. And it turned out that he needed to travel for like a half hour to pick them up and then a half hour back. And they, I put myself under the description of a mother that will cook for Shabbat. That was my description on Friday. And that's what I did. So it was, um, it was a very, very memorable trip. One, to be able to connect Shlomo that whole week. And then his friends coming and joining and then having a Shabbat with his friends from yeshiva it was so beautiful and be able to have them in our car because they were doing public transportation anyway it was it was amazing amazing and i'm looking forward to my next trip already um okay there's one more avoda but as i said i will not touch it it's a bit too long unless you know we're finished what i wanted to teach so we are in the month of elu we are in the month before rosh hashanah we are i mean now we are two weeks before Rosh Hashanah, but we are in the month of Elul. And Elul, Aleph, Lamed, Vav, Lamed, has many acronyms. There are many definitions of Elul. And I want to take the most um, known one of what does Elul stand for. And what Elul stands for is Ani Ledodi, Vedodi Li. In, in other words, I am for my beloved, and my beloved is for me. I am for God, and God is for me. And I want to break down the words, but the first word of Elul is Ani, and that's the word that we are going to focus on. We're going to focus the word me. Um, like I am for my beloved, Ani Ledodi, Ani, me, I, I. And breaking down the word I is going to be our starting point and our, like, um, we're going to catapult 
from this world, from this word into our avodah for Chodesh Elul in order to be able to get into Rosh Hashanah. Now, how much am I, how much is that I, that I of me, how much of me is influenced by my, my, by my, by my surroundings? How much of that I is being led by others? And how much of that I is influenced also by expectations that different people have about me? There's a rabbi in Petach Tikva that I really like, and his name is Rav Eyal. And Rav Eyal had, had a, lived in a mixed religious, not religious neighborhood. And one of his, uh, one of his neighbors started, was totally not religious, him and his wife, and started to learn a little bit about Judaism and started to keep the mitzvah slowly, slowly. And he reached a point that he decided that he wants to be Shomer Shabbat. And he, once he decided that that is what he wanted to do, right? That, that was like, he really realized his eye, his me, his eye, that is what he wanted to do. Um, he, he told his wife, and his wife was not into it at all, didn't want to keep anything, was not interested. And she was living her life and he was living his life and both of them respected each other. And she told him, listen, I'm very happy for you and it's great. I just want to let you know that on Shabbat, you know, Friday night in Israel, even people who are not religious, they go to their, to eat by their families. Like they go eat, like the mother, the grandmother has everyone over. She said, I want to continue going to eat by my mother. We can't sleep there because their house is small. It's not comfortable for them. It's not comfortable for me. And we used to drive there every Friday night. And I, I want to continue doing it. And I want you to be there with me. So he went to Rav Eyal and he told him, uh, he went to, to, to Rav Eyal Beret and, and he said, listen, I'm a marathon runner. And my mother-in-law's house is 38 kilometers. 38 kilometers is like, 15 miles away from my house. And, and we can drive to my mother-in-law's house. And I just want to ask you if it would be okay, like halakhakli, if I put like every five miles water for myself as we drive, I'll drop water. And then I, I and I'll run the 38 kilometers, like the 15 miles back home. And, you know, is that allowed? And Rav Eyal Vered was very, very overcome. And he said, and he, he, he lifted his eyes and he said, Master of the universe, look at your children. They want to keep Shabbat. And they also want to keep the relationship with their wife. And they have, want to have a relationship with their in-laws. And they want to keep Torah. And look what this man is willing to do to, 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 to have his that son of keeping Shabbat come to fruition. So when we say the word in Hebrew, larut, to run, larut, right? This man, he wanted to run. He wanted to run, he wanted larut. Larut comes from the word of ratzon. When we have a ratzon, when we have a desire, when, when I say what I want, I'm actually saying not only who I am, but when I say how I want, I'm already halfway there. I'm halfway to, like, because when I say my son, my mind is already there. And wherever my mind, that's where I am. So as soon as we have it at son, we um, need to do one thing. We need to, and when I say, you know, when I say we want to speak about the word, ani le dodi, ani is my son. Who I am is who my retzonot are. So as soon as I have that at son, there is no other option, but I have, I have two options when I say my ratzon. I could either start running to do my ratzon, or I could stick spokes in my wheel. You know, I could, how do you say, I don't like, you know, you have the wheels going and then you stick a stick in the wheel and it stumbles. What? So those are my two options. One is to, to bless myself and start running with my ratzon, ratzon larutz, right? Or I could put sticks in my wheels and start saying, yeah, but what, if, you know, what are they going to say? What are they going to think? They're going to be disappointed, et cetera. Like my friend's daughter told her, ma, I want a tent. Am I not honest to have a tent? The minute she said that, like in her mind, she was already with that tent, right? So, so now the matter is, is she going to, um, is the mother going to say, yeah, but you don't have money. Yeah, but you really don't need. Yes, but, yes, but. 
or tell her you could go run with your son, run with it. You know, you have X, you know, what are you willing to do for it? Running with your son means asking you yourself a question of what is the first thing I am willing to do for it? So now when I have my retzonos, either I put obstacles in my path or I give myself a blessing and say, go on your way and fulfill your retzon. Like I back myself up because the way my thoughts look like, right, um, will be the way my external world will look like. So, so if my thoughts are, you know, giving myself stumbling blocks of why I can't make my that son happen, that's what my world is going to look like. You know, some people think that Chodesh Elul is like going, in Israel, we have something that once a year, I don't know if you have it in the States, but you have a car and we need to have it tested. We go into the garage and they test like the brakes and the lights and, you know, and the exhaust and does it have too much smoke coming out and, or all everything functioning good because they want to have safe cars on the road. So it means going through a test every year. And people sometimes think that Chodesh Elul is, is like taking the car for a test. It means, you know, the, the, the guy comes and he has a whole list of things and he goes, open up your light, check, do your brakes, okay, X, um, do the exhaust, X, too much, too little, too this, too that. And that is not the story of Elul. We do not go before God, and it's not when he, he's not testing us to see what did you do right, what did you do wrong, what needs to be fixed, what doesn't need to be fixed. That's, that's not what Chodesh Elul, this is not what Rosh Hashanah is here for. What Rosh Hashanah is here for is for me to pass myself before Hashem, and he tells me, what do you want this year? What is your son this year? I am here to give it to you. I'm here to give you backing. I have your back. I just need for you to tell me what your son is. You'll get everything, any blessing. Just tell me what it is so we could create a vessel of ourselves um, to receive God's blessing, to receive the light. So what God wants us to create within ourselves um, is he wants to create us. He wants us to create a a uh, uh, big enough vessel, a clean enough vessel for his light to come into us and he could actually give us the blessing. Now, he wants us to be able to receive the light. Now, when I say my red sonos, I don't want to say of what I don't want, but I don't want to be angry. I don't want to feel guilty. I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to constantly be pleasing everyone. I don't want to say what I don't want. I want to say what I do want. So, I need to be able to discern my son and follow it and, and, and follow up with what is the first step I'm willing to do to make it happen. Now, we say, what is avera? What is a sin? Avera. Avera comes from two words. Avar ra. It means that you look at the past, the avar, and you look at it as bad. You look at the way your parents raised you. You look at the way your husband was with you. You look at the way what your children did to you, whatever. You look at the past and you say, you know, so many bad things happened, which is why I am who I am today. So I want to say that um, in, okay, well, wait, I forgot to tell you this. In Norway, I, before I left, I went to a couple of friends. One of them was Katie. And I asked them if they had any great books that they recommend. Like I took, I wanted to take like a pile of books with me even though like we weren't allowed to take too many stuff, but we, um, but books were, because I knew I wasn't going to be on my phone. I knew I was going to have a lot of time to read and I was looking forward to it. One of the books Katie gave me was called, um, a book called The Size of Your Dream, a book that transforms lives. Hold on one second, I'm getting it. One minute, I want to show it to you. Okay, here it is. It's called The Size of Your Dreams, a book that transforms lives. And um, it recommending you to go on Amazon and buy it right away. I read it three times. It was incredible. Um, and I, I started, I went and I met the author already and I wanna start working with him. 
and it's very connected to what we're learning. So totally recommended. Oh, it's by um, Dave and Hannah Mason, and they live um, they live actually down the block from Katie, and she was kind enough to take me. Um, but another book that she she gave me is is called The Choice, and um, it's a Holocaust survivor turned psychologist who goes through her history and has a lot of insight. And it, we, and when, like Michal Peretz was saying, Avira is Avara, she said, there's a sentence that she said in the book, and it's, life does not happen to you, it happens for you. In order for us not to look at our Avar on the past and see that it was Ra, see the It happened specifically for us, and we need to give it a twist. Um, we need to give it a twist <clears throat> of how was the past created specifically for me to be able to get my strength, to be able to get the teachings that I need, to be able to get the lessons that I need to walk in this world. Okay. So now Hashem does not want anything from us. He wants to walk with us and to hear from us. And Hashem is like, he's telling us, I want to give you health and strength and money. And I just need for you to expand yourself to all the things to fit. So Elul is preparing ourselves like, like a vessel, like a kli. For, for, the, for the coming year, where do we need to fix things and where so the, so the light could come in? So I have a story of, you know, what does it mean, Ani? What is this Ani? What does this mean? So my, uh, my friend has a daughter whose name is Raz. And um, this daughter works in the studio. She's an exercise teacher and she works in the studio. And my friend had an idea that she would like to take well, her single children, and it was three children that are still single, she wanted to take them to Sinai, which is um, uh, like a, a lot of desert and water, and it's by the Reed Sea and snorkeling, and it's out of Israel. And she wanted to take her little children on a vacation for four or five days. And all of them were very excited to go. And Raz, who was an exercise teacher, sent the director of the studio um, a WhatsApp a week previous. And she said, these are the dates I'm not gonna be in. Um, please find a substitute for me because I'm going away with my mother. Anyway, they decided that they're gonna leave Saturday night in order for them to get to the Sinai border late Saturday night, go in and everybody Sunday morning, wake up in the Sinai. So Shabbat is out and they're packing. And all of a sudden, Raz gets a, gets a phone call from the director of the studio. And the director goes, listen, I didn't understand what you meant, that you weren't going to be also Sunday. I just got someone for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. But Sunday, it wasn't clear that you weren't going to be here. I assumed that Sunday you are here. And I'm expecting you to come tomorrow and, and uh, be, uh, you know, and, and teach. So Raz came and told her mother, you know, I'm I'm really torn. I have I, I have an atzon to uh, um, honor of my commitment to the studio, and I have an atzon to go to Sinai. And her mother started to work with her, and it turns out like this word commitment. I have a commitment to the director of the studio. No, we have a commitment to ourselves. We don't have a commitment to anyone else but ourselves. Because when we start being committed, um, when we are trying to commit ourselves to other people, it's like we're taking over and trying to, to, to um, do, how do you say, to create the good that the other person should be creating for himself. We, now, she's the director of the um, of, of the studio. And it's her responsibility, it's her job to find uh, a um, to find a substitute. And if she misunderstood or whatever, that's fine. However, it really, Raz's 
description as an exercise teacher is to teach exercise. It's not to find other, it's not to find other um, substitutes. And her director's job is to be able to see where, um, you know, to, to, to see, you know, where she, whether she understood it or not understood it, she's the one that's supposed to be getting the substitute. Now, Raz was about to not go Saturday night with her mother and stay Sunday and then just take a bus, which would have taken double the time and missed a full day with her mother, with the siblings that were going to be there. So her, her, her realization was, is that her Ratzon, her Ratzon was to go to the Sinai. And there was another Ratzon within her, and that was to take care of the director, to placate her, to please her, to all, all that. And, and that is not the Ani. When we want to bring Hashem, our Ani, we need to bring our clean Ratzon. Ani ledodi. I am for God, and God will be for me, but it needs to be the me. Had she stayed to please her director, not to step on her toes, that it's not going to be hard for her to take care of her. She is not being her anymore. She's being the director. But that's a place that is not her description, passing her friends, not needing to go there, etc. So the minute Raz decided that her son really is to go to Sinai, she called the director and she said, I... I, uh, my plan was to leave Saturday night. I'm leaving Saturday night. I am going and I hope you find a, you know, I'm going Saturday night. That's what I want to do. She didn't even say, I hope you're going to find a substitute or anything like that. And the director said, okay, fine. I see. Great. Have a good time and whatever. Now, um, and as at that point, she was able to take the ani, the I, the me, and really hone it down, respect it, go with it, and, um, and connect to it, and be authentically herself. I am not, I, I want to tell you that, that um, my obligation is towards myself, and I have an obligation to all my parts that are in me to be able to reveal themselves in this world. I am not obligated to the owner. I'm not obligated to my children. I'm not obligated to my husband. I'm not obligated to my parents. I am not obligated. I have, let's say I have a desire to visit my mother and a desire to go to the beach, right? I'm not going, there's a part of me that really wants to see my mother. And there's a part of me that really wants to go to the beach. Now, I don't want to go to my mother because I feel obligated. I don't want to go because my mother wants me to come. I want to reveal myself into the, to, to this world and realize that there's one part of me that wants to go to my mother. There is another part of me that wants to go to the beach. Both of them are me. And one of them is not going to come at the expense of the other because if I feel that one of them is going to come at the expense of the other, we're going to have an internal war inside of us, right? One ratzon is like pulling the other one down instead of one ratzon backing this self, themselves up. So I'm going back to that. She saw herself that she was trying to appease the director of the studio and, and appeal to him and go out of her fence into the director's fence, whose job it was to find, you know, the substitute. And the minute she said, this is what I want to do, when she was fully behind the eye, with no guilt, with no recriminations, with no cringing, um, the people around us accept it. Um, we have also, so, so we want to come with this Ani, with this Ani in Elul to God. And we want to come also with the realization that there is a word that we keep on saying over and over and over again in the Tefillah of Rosh Hashanah. And that word is um, King Melech, Melech. We say Hamelech Hamishpat, Hamelech Hagadol, Hamelech Hakadosh. The word Melech is predominantly in our Tefillot, and that is because on Rosh Hashanah is the time where we accept God's kingship on us, in our world. We want to accept him into us. He is our king. Um, and, and girls, it's not something he's our king, he's up there. It's not like the, the queen of England, she's my queen, I live in England and I never see her and I 
never, you know, I never have a relationship with her and I don't have a conversation with her, but she's, no, he is my king, right? And it, and it is my job to like coronate him, to crown him as my king. He's my personal king in my life. And one of the, one of the, you know, proofs that Rosh Hashanah is the time that I say, I accept God as my king, not somewhere out there. He is my king. He is my, um, how do you say? He's my authority, right? Um, in, in, in Hebrew, authority means samchut. And it means, an authority means someone I could count on and someone who only wants good for me. So I'm actually crowning God who, he is someone that I could count on in my life. And he is someone that is only out to do good for me. Those are the two things that I do when I crown my king on, on myself. And one of the ways we prove it is we have a shofar. We have a shofar. And the shofar, we blow in honor of the king. We blow the shofar before we start a new year because we realize there's a king to this world and there's a king in my life. And he's the authority. And he watches over. And he drew my life's journey already. And he created a very personal private gym for me where I will get the workout of my life. And those are my challenges. And, and I need to realize when the shofar is being blown, that it's an opportunity for me to A, thank God for everything that I have in my life. And B, it's an opportunity like, to go one thing at a time and thank and thank. And B, it's a time to realize where my avodah is and to ask for him to be able to help us to do this avodah. And let's say if it was me and my son in Norway and my avodah is, God, please help me stop taking care of people so that um, they will be able to take care of themselves. I don't want to feel like I'm the one responsible for everyone. I want everyone to be able to stand on their own two feet and hold me back from taking care and solving people's problems and trying to make my children happy, right? Now, those are things that are so difficult to do that there is no way we can do it unless we pray for it. Like there is no way, that, it's, it's that desire of wanting my children to be happy and trying to make them happy is bigger than who I am, is bigger than me. And the only way I can do it is if Hashem helps me. That will be the only way I can survive. I can do this avodah. I can take the next step. I can grow is if God helps me. So on Rosh Hashanah, when we um, blow the shofar and we say, God, we crown you in my life, we are going to also Thank him for all the things that we have to be grateful for and ask for the strength to go up to the next level and do the avodah. Now, Hashem gives me the good things, right? In my life, everything is good. What he gives me is through them, I, through the, from the good things, I, I thank him and through the challenges, I can train to get closer to him. So, so anything that we have is to be grateful for. One is to thank him for what we do have and we have so much good. And uh, the second is the challenges that we have is for us to be able to work out our muscles. And when we work on these muscles, that's how we get close to him. Um, it, I mean, this is something that, you know, is very known, but like, the snake who uh, who slithers on the ground and he eats, you know, and God cursed him, just eat the earth. He has no connection to God because there's nothing that he needs ever. So the help that we need, the challenges that we have, all those are create an ability for us to be closer to him. And Rosh Hashanah is, a, is, is going to be the time where we're going to stay in shul, we're going to go to shul, we're going to listen to the blast, and we're going to say, I want to thank you, and I want to be able to use the challenges to grow close to you. 
I had an understanding in Norway that, um, first of all, we were there and there's water, there's glaciers all around and the water is just uh, waterfalls everywhere, streams everywhere. There was not a meal that we had that wasn't sitting near the water to eat and, um, and, and lakes. And I thought to myself, it, um, first of all, I never saw one person go into the water, the water's freezing. So first, the temperature is like 70 degrees and the water's ice, but no one's in it. So it's like a lot of water that I'm just looking at, but really can't use it. And I thought of Israel, we have very little water. Any water we have is like quite, is, is like nice and cool. And it's so hot outside that all we want to do is jump into it. So we see like a teeny lake in Israel with a million people. In Norway, we saw vast lakes and rivers and streams. And I never saw one person. At a certain point, Shlomo said, Ima, I'm going in. Like, it can't be that I'm going to be here and I'm not going to go in the water. So we stopped on the side of the road. He went up, up to like a cliff and he took his clothes off and he was going to dive down. And all of a sudden we saw like 10 cars stopping to watch him and see him dive into the frigid water. Um, and uh, so I, I, I had a feeling that Israel, it has everything very, very small, but it's very intimate. And over there, everything is very big. And, and I couldn't come near the water because it was so cold. Like it wasn't inviting, like Israel is more inviting. But another thought that I had is that in Israel, every year we start praying for the rain and we pray for rain. We need the rain. If there's no rain, the crops really do not grow. If there's no rain, um, there is a drought. Uh, the farmers, like the, the prices of fruits and vegetables are gonna go up. The price, the, the farmers lose their, they lose their, their panasa. And, and praying for rain is, is a very visceral part of our existence in Israel. And God tells us when he takes us out of Mitzrayim, he tells, he tells us, I'm taking you to a land where it's not going to be like Mitzrayim, where in Mitzrayim they had denial and all they needed to do was take their foot. It says, it, it, it's not like Eretz Mitzrayim where you could water your land by your foot. It was an agriculture of canals that you just took your, your foot and you would open a canal with your foot and the water would come in. You just have water gushing in. It wasn't a place where we needed to connect to Hashem to pray to him. And Hashem tells us, Israel is gonna be a place of connection where it will not be with your foot that you'll water. It's gonna be a place where I want you to be able to have a relationship with me. I want to have a relationship with you and I'm taking you to a place where things are not gonna be so easy. So when things are not easy, it's, it's, it's the point where God is saying, I want a relationship. I want um, a connection. I want to be part of your life. And Rosh Hashanah is an incredible place to start and bringing him into our life. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions so far? And then I'm going to go to the next step of the, uh, of the class. Any questions? Anyone? I could pause. Okay. I have like these yummy visits next to me and they're delicious. Okay. Now, one of the ways, um, this is now, I'm taking the class to another level. It's a lot of material in one class. Listen to the class over again if you want. But this next part is really, really important. Um, so the, the word melech is, the word melech, first of all, is the word that we say a hundred times a day. Baruch atah Hashem Elokeinu melech ha'olam. In, in Shacharit, when we pray in the morning, we say it a hundred times. And, and the reason we pray in the morning, actually, is we say God's name so many times that we allow him to become a presence in our life. Whenever, like, when, when, when we're making a wedding, let's say, we wake up in the morning with the list of what we need to do, the wedding becomes very present in our life. So we want God's presence to be in our life. We wake up and the prayer, we're constantly saying, Melech, Melech, Melech. Okay. Now, Melech means in order to have him enter my life, I need to empty my head 
and only allow what Hashem puts in my head, that is what will be. Now this year, the Avodah that we're going to do is to, I want to empty my mind from the thoughts, from the way I used to look at things, from my past conceptions, from my past misconceptions. I want to take everything out of my mind that blackens and darkens my mind. And to accept, I want to accept, to put in my mind what God decides to put in my mind. How do I do that? First of all, um, I want to be able to, okay, I want to be able to put names in my head that are going to create light in my head. Okay. When I give anything a name, when I interpret a situation, any situation that creates lightness and happiness in my head, that is when I allow God's presence to come into my head. Now, when I say that I want to have God to crown him over me, it means that the only word I could use in my head, if I want Hashem to be the king over me, if I want to crown him in my life, the only word I could use in my head is the word tov, is the word good. Because God's name, God has many names, and now we're going to work with the word of tov. The name of Hashem is Uhatov Hamati. He, he does good and he creates good and he's all good. And so that is the only word I want us to have in our heads. I want to say Tov. He, who, who, anything that I see is going to be Tov. There's no such thing as bad or negative in this world. We're only going from Tov to Tov, from good to good, from thankfulness to more thankfulness, from happiness to happiness, from party to party. That is how we are going to walk in this world. Because when I touch something and I call it bad, when I see something and I call it bad, when I say, oh my God, I feel so bad, even in a very small, minuscule way, I banish Hashem from my presence. I banish the light from my mind. I start to blacken and darken my mind. That minute there's a darkness within me because, because when when we say something bad, the source can only be Hashem. And because Hashem is all good, we can't have both of them together. So when there's a bad thought in my mind, I banish Hashem out. And that is the opposite of what we're trying to do on Rosh Hashanah. So let's say I, it's Friday. I know I give this example all the time, but so many people in Israel resonate. And I don't know, I don't know if this is what you resonate with, but Friday, I'm working and I see my husband waking up and going for a run and going to the gym and lying on the couch and reading a book and I'm preparing for Shabbat and there's so much work. And that's how he starts his morning. And uh, I look at him and I say, what do I say? Am I going to say something that's going to give me a dark feeling or am I going to say something that's going to give me a light feeling? So now I could look at him and say, look at this man. He's not connected to reality. He thinks just about himself. He's so selfish, right? Or I'll give another example. This is an example that my friend gave actually in class. She said that um, she that it was supposed to be a really small Shabbat and she had five pieces of chicken in the freezer. She didn't feel like going to the supermarket. Five pieces of chicken, there were gonna be seven people, enough, you know, there's rice and vegetables and everything. She made the five pieces of chicken and it turns out that um, her, her son invited a friend and they weren't, Seven people, they were 10 people. Right? And Friday night, everybody, after she lit candles, there's nothing to do. And she uh, has five pieces of chicken, there are 10 people. And her husband takes two pieces of chicken, right? And the thoughts that went through her head, what did she say? He's totally out of touch with reality. He thinks only about himself. He, doesn't he see that there are children here? Doesn't he see that we're 10 people and there's only five pieces? And he's putting two pieces on his plate? What is this? Right? Now, we used to think that when we say these things, we're actually in touch with reality. This is like, we used to think that because he took two pieces of chicken, I said those bad things. But the reality is there are bad, there are dark things in my mind. And that's why I said 
dark things when he took the two pieces of chicken. So we have to reverse our, the way that we look at the world. We start off with negativity in our head and therefore we will see negativity around us, right? Um, we need to realize that the story is only in our head. And at that moment, we lose God in our lives because that's the moment we're in our heads, we look at it and we say, Loto, when God created the world, all, everything that he said was Vayar Hashem Kito. And I'm not going to go through this with you, but there are many times that God commanded something to happen. And it seems like the creation actually went and did what she wanted. Like, it wasn't exactly like God said. It, the, 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 when the creation happened, it happened a little bit in a different way. But God always looked at it and Vayar Kito. There was always talk. So, so we lose God in our lives and in our heads is when we look at a situation and we look at it and we say, low talk, there's a problem with it. Okay, now what is the problem with it? The problem is we take the name that we give our husband and we believe that this is who he really is. Selfish, inconsiderate, not connected to reality, uh, doesn't see anyone, right? We, we, we have those names in our head and then anything he will do, we're going to interpret in that light, in the light of the dark that we just attributed to him. So it doesn't matter what he does anymore because our opinion is solidified. Now, first of all, whenever we see anything around us, part of our avodah is, first of all, not to say anything. Like, not to say anything. Oh, I just want to say something funny. Um, the husband, meanwhile, my friend's husband, he was telling her, my wife, this is like a, this is such an amazing chicken, made such a great meal, delicious, yummy. I never tasted such a good chicken in my life. And and, and her in her head, it was um, like, oh, oh my God, like selfish. What's he doing? Doesn't see anyone, right? And then, and then what usually happens is that couples, they go to therapy and they tell the, the, the therapist, you know, there's no communication between us. Of course, there's no communication. He's talking totally. He's in one universe talking about, you know, this chicken has gone at dead. And she's like, this man is like the most selfish person. And, and how could there be any communication when we are talking two different languages from two different universes with God not being there at all? Because once I put the word lotov in my head, like this isn't good, this isn't right, this isn't should be, this, this, is, this isn't the way it should be, right? God is out. That's it. Oh, it, it, this isn't the way it should be. Okay, I guess the, you know, you know better and I'll just step out of your life. So we, we need to realize the bigger problem is that that, 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 that the low talk is inside of us and it's in here inside of me and, and it harms me. And why should I ever continue doing it, right? It just harms me when I say these things about my husband and, and when we see something happening, we need to clear our mind and not have any comment to say about it. What a slob, what a pig, what a this, what a, no. These words shouldn't be like selfish, inconsiderate. These words, they're the ones that create the darkness in our minds. And they come because, or because previously there was darkness in my mind, okay? So we don't wanna harm ourselves. We wanna allow Hashem in. And, and I want to walk with the king and he will decide what will be in my, in my life. But what I need to have in my head is quiet to be able to relinquish all thoughts that create noise because we're looking for white, for empty, for, for clean. I met a woman this week who at 37, she got married. And after two months, she wants to get divorced and she has a whole list of why the guy she's with is insufferable. She can't live with him. And she doesn't realize that these thoughts about him have nothing to do with him, but all they're doing is poisoning her, right? They have nothing to do. She's creating a river of negativity inside of her that poisoned her life. Because in this world, we're really lacking nothing. And if we create bad, bad feelings, it's created from within us. How could, how could my husband, by taking more pieces of chicken, how could, he, how could that make me feel bad? 
He took chicken and he's having a good time with it. How could it lead me to having bad feelings? What does it have to do with me? It has nothing to do with me. He lies on the couch. How could that make me feel bad, right? How could I see something outside of me that exists and how could that make me feel bad? Because there's nothing on the outside that could make me feel bad, nothing, right? Usually when a woman sees something, we always have something to say about it. Like my son came in after, uh, after hiking for a couple of days, filthy, disgusting, dirty, went into bed without taking a shower, without taking an article of clothing off, right? Well, in our minds, what goes is like, how could he, it's smelly, it's dirty, disgusting, a slob, a this, a that. Like we always have something to say and what we want to relinquish, what we want to pray for is for Hashem to help us, right? Immediately, right? I see it, I see it. And immediately my head starts talking. And at that minute, when I start talking all these things, I create darkness within myself. Now, until I realize that the most important person in this world, the most important person in this world is me. And other than me, no one else is important until we realize that, however, right? Um, we will always, if, if I don't realize that I'm the most important person in the world, we will constantly be poisoning our heads with a litany of complaints and comments in our brain, in our brain. Because if we realize that we're the most important, but there's a sentence that, that, that about Hashem who said, and on mil vado. There is no one but him in this world. And I'm adding to that. There is no one but me. There's no one but me. So there's no one but him. And there's no one but me. And that's it. And until I realize that, right? Um, that um, if there's no one but me, there's only me to take responsibility for my life and what my life's journey will look like. People try to convince me that what I see outside is a fact. Don't you see this? Like, don't you see this boy? This, this was my friend that her son came in and went into bed and after a couple of days of hiking and didn't shower, muddy and dusty and dirty. Like, like it's a fact. He's here. You see him. He went into bed. He's dirty, right? Now, she feels like that's a fact. And that is a fact. But what she says in her head is what she has control over. So whatever she says in her head that we have control over, we have control whether we're going to allow light in our head and, and look at our son and, and just say, he's exhausted, that's it, that's it. And, and as opposed to the other, which I'm not gonna get into that whole litany. And, and this Rosh Hashanah, we wanna come and leave my head clean in order for us to have the ability um, to host God in our head. We want to host him. All the shofar blowing is for him to be able to be hosted within us. And there is no other option here. When I choose to talk about the other, when I talk about the other, oh, my husband wants this from me and you know, my, my mother wants this from me and my daughter and my children expect that from me and, and my friends also have you know, have that expectation. Like my mother expects me to visit her and my husband expects me to be in Tel Aviv and my children expect me to watch their children, et cetera, et cetera. This is my life, right? And I talk about them, you know, when I talk about them in a way that is not respectful, in a way that is not, does not highlight their strong point, I'm really not talking about them. I'm just showing myself how much garbage I have in my head. And when I have all that garbage in my head, there is one entity that cannot appear in my head. And that is the creator, you know, the almighty. He cannot make himself known in my life. And I am waiting um, I am what, what we really are trying to do in this world, once we do clean our head, we will be able to hear the voice of God, which is why I tell you like prophecy is not so far, is not so far away from us. If we would be able to really clear our heads and peel all, you know, the darkness 
and and ask God to help us do it, we will be able to hear the voice of Hashem, right? We will be able to know that Hashem is very apparent because there will not be so much clutter in our heads and he will make himself known. And he wants to make himself known to us. And he tells us, take out the garbage, take out the darkness, and I will make myself known. Now, when we argue with people, when we go, I, I want to tell you like an, this is like a small avodah. I have um, one, of, one of my siblings has a child that, um, that decided to become not religious and decided that there's no God and he's an atheist and all they fed him, what they fed him in yeshiva was, you know, they just constricted him and he wants to just go and experience everything in the world, et cetera. So, so um, he called me up and he said, you know, uh, do you mind if I moved out of my parents' house and moved to your house because um, I can't handle my parents' pressure? I said, yeah, sure, come stay. I have extra bedrooms. During uh, the week, I told him, listen, during the week, the house is yours. Shabbat, a mob scene. You just need to be aware. So he came. And now, um, last night, there was a wedding. It was a family wedding. And I met, you know, my, my sister-in-law. I met my sister-in-law, who, it, it was her son. And she approached me, and she said, you know, I don't want you to have my son there. And I don't want him to be by you. And I, you know, uh, I don't want him to be in Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv is a bad influence. And she was also trying to tell me you're a bad influence. And immediately I, so immediately I started to tell her, you can't tell your son what to do. And if he wants, he could come and you're not the boss of him and he's 25 years old. And what, like, like I, I started to go into a, a war. The minute we start to have conflict and we feel like we're in a war with someone, God is not there. God is shalom. He's not in, in a war. He's not in a place of conflict. And we need to try, just as we try to clear our heads from all the negative, dark, uh, defeating, guilt ridding thoughts in our heads, right? That's to, to allow Hashem's light in. We want to have him in our life. It's not going to be through war. It's not going to be through the war between one that's son and the other that's son. It's not going to be a war between, you know, me and my sister-in-law. And, uh, and and it just, I, I watched it escalate. And at a certain point, I just cut and I left. I, I left my car. I left the wedding. I got into my car and I got myself like, like how? Like, what was it that brought me to a level of arguing with them? How, how did that happen to you? And immediately I said, like, what do I want to do? I want to go and just apologize and say, it's your son. You, it's your right to do whatever you want with him. It's your right not to want him to be in Tel Aviv. This is your call. And I am going to step out. And it's between you and your son. And I apologize. I apologize. I apologize. I went in and I apologized a couple of times over. And she told me, yes, I'm glad you came and apologized. I'm glad you see it my way. Yeah, the truth is, I'm not telling her son anything. I'm not telling her anything. My house is open. She and her son could work it out. Let them do whatever they want. But going down into the conflict is taking God out of my life. It is, it is um, taking the shalom out of my life. And when I don't have the shalom, I don't have Hashem with me. And I want him to be there with me. Um, now, when I see something or when I say something about someone, right, which is negative, I disconnect myself from myself, and I disconnect from him, because at that point, I'm in darkness, I'm in discontent, I'm in judgment, I'm in critical. Okay, so God is here, he's with us, and we have no possibility of taking steps without him. However, there's one question that we need to ask ourselves. He, he's here, he's all, he's all here and with us, but the question is, how much are we going to be able to see his hashgacha? his miracles, his laws. How are we going to be able to see that every single thing happens to me is from him and it's from my good. And he waits for us. He waits for us with a lot of patience and he wants to work with us hand in hand. And sometimes with my own hand, I block it by thinking that everything is up to me and, there's, and I don't give him space to maneuver in my life. Now, what is the process that happens? I have a bad feeling in me. I have a bad feeling. I, I didn't see anything. I, I saw nothing. 
I wake up and there's a bad, there's like a bad feeling in me. And to let it go and to allow the light to come in, I say something bad about something, someone else, right? I'm saying something, I, I see someone and the bad in me just gets interpreted into the, the, the next person. And then immediately I feel like the, the light comes back to me because I deflect the bad feeling on the other. But in, in truth, I, 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 want it, I want that bad to leave me and go and, and stay by the other, but it doesn't happen. It just creates more negativity within me. And all I want is for the light to be there. All I want is for the light. Um, I want to tell you a story that happened. Um, I went to Pnei Kedem, and in Pnei Kedem, there's a woman there whose uncle has one of the biggest avocado orchards where he actually has the orchards in order to make um, honey from the avocado plant. And um, I went there and I just bought a container for myself and I made myself tea and I mixed the honey in the tea, like a quarter of a teaspoon. And I tasted it and it was just heavenly. Like it was the best batch he ever made. And I've been eating that honey for a while. It was delicious. And I told my grandchildren, I gave them money. And I said, I want you to buy six jars of this honey because I would like to uh, give to each one of my children. And um, so they, 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 you know, I gave them the money and I gave them the bags and they went and they bought it from, from, from the neighbor that lives, you know, a 10 minute walk and they all came back and I gave my daughter Rini the jar and I went to um, another daughter's home to also give her the jar. And it turns out that, that in my daughter's home, her friend was there, her friend who, um, who was divorced. And uh, I, I was telling my daughter, oh, this is such a delicious um, honey. I, I, you must have it for Rosh Hashanah. But the friend was like, oh, like, yeah, well, what is it? How is it? Where'd you get it from? Or could, could I taste? So my, my daughter said, yeah, sure. And she opened up the jar. The friend opened up the jar and took a huge spoon and clunked into it and literally took a quarter of the jar and, and ate it. And I found myself telling myself like on automatic, like no wonder she's getting divorced. Like she's just like, without a thought to anything, she finished a quarter of the jar of honey that I bought my daughter. Now, what is that thought doing there? What is that thought doing there? This woman, I took the honey, she knows how to do good for herself and she's allowed to do good for herself. And she's actually been put into this world to do good for herself. Am I responsible for the world's honey division? God sent her to me at that minute for me to be able to work on her, on, on, on myself and take out the last vestiges of garbage in my head. At that point, when I came to my daughter's house, I must have had like probably some kind of negative or dark thought. And immediately they just honed in on her and they were directed towards her. It had nothing to do with her eating the honey or not eating the honey. Now, God sent her to me to be able to work on it. And he gives me serious challenges. And at that minute, I, I, I gave, I took out the honey jar that I bought for myself and I gave it to her. Like at that minute, I just wanted to give it, you know, you know what's good and you want to do good for yourself. You deserve a jar of honey for yourself. Now, when, when I say about the other person, when I see the other person doing like my husband taking two pieces of chicken, my son lying on the couch and reading a book, this woman taking honey, you know, and finishing the quarter of a jar of honey that I just gave my daughter. When I say, when I see that and I say, she knows how to do good for herself. I'm not doing it for her. I'm not saying it to be nice to her. I'm doing it for myself. I'm doing it to be good to myself because, because the other way saying, oh my God, like look how much she took, but that creates negativity. That creates, that gives me a bad feeling in my heart. So I'm not trying to do anything good for her. I just want to do good for myself. And that's why I'm saying she knows how to do good for her. Now in this world, I do good for myself and I do good for others. Like let's say I make a salad. I make a salad, I do good for myself. And then I can make a big salad and I know how to do good for my family. I do good for them. And um, 
and, and, and each one on our own level, we need to find the balance between doing good for myself and doing good for them. But the highest level is when a person does good for himself because there's a huge aspect of gratitude to God when I do good for myself. Imagine I sit down and I chop a salad and I make it all pretty and I sit down and I eat it. We appreciate every bite. We are appreciate every, every step that goes into it. And I, I'm, and, and I don't get to appreciate it as much when I make it for everyone and everyone's eating the salad. When I take a cluster of grapes and I wash it and I sit down and I eat it, I'm able to really appreciate it. And my happiness and my gratitude is very great for what I have. So we need to decide that we're here to do good for ourselves. We are the only one responsible to do this for ourselves. And no one else is going to do good for us, but we will do good for ourselves. And we need to also realize that our children are responsible to create their own good, to get along with others, to know, you know, in school, when to sit, when to play, when to learn. They are responsible for their good. And when we try to take care and take charge of our children's happiness, they will not take responsibility for their happiness, for their thoughts. If we do it, they're not going to do it. So sometimes also, instead of taking charge of our own happiness, we, we shift outside and we look how to take care of our children's happiness. And when we do it, we teach them that they're incapable and incompetent to be able to take care of their own happiness, their own life. Um, okay, wow. I could say that I literally gave you a half the class that I wanted to, but I'm going to stop right now. Ask if there's any questions. I'm going to stop for a minute the recording.